We'll go to the front row first, our Afghan colleague. Uh, I'm Parvez Kawa from Afghanistan. Uh, yesterday you outlined the importance of uh, uh, political uh, solutions for Afghanistan peace. And you know Ashraf Ghani, President Ashraf Ghani has made several trips to Pakistan at the beginning of his administration to address, uh, to, to start talks with Pakistani officials on Afghanistan conflict. And you know now uh, we have a forested level engagement for, uh, that includes Afghanistan, Pakistan, United States and China. Uh, to deal with uh, uh, the peace of Afghanistan. How do you assess the rule of Pakistan and what is NATO going to do about to, uh, to put pressure on Pakistan to uh, be more engaged uh, in Afghanistan peace? So we have always uh, stated very clearly that uh, there can only be a political solution to the conflict in Afghanistan and therefore we welcome uh, all efforts to try to find a political solution including the outreach of uh, the Afghan unity government uh, to uh, countries in the region. Uh, and of course also uh, the contact with uh, Pakistan. And uh, I welcome uh, all efforts to try to uh, make uh, Afghanistan uh, and uh, 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 working more closely with uh, with uh, neighbors, uh, also Pakistan. And I think that uh, Pakistan can uh, contribute and uh, has a key role to play when it comes to the political process, trying to find a political solution. And NATO has uh, expressed strong, strong support uh, to the efforts to find a political solution, including uh, the engagement with uh, uh, Pakistan. Wall Street General. Um, Mr. Secretary General, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit more about the, the meeting last night uh, on Russia. Um, do you have more commitments from nations to pr provide, uh, to be framework nations for the battalions uh, in the East? And is your announcement of uh, a request for a NATO-Russia uh, council, do, do you think it's particularly important to, uh, to talk with Russia about what NATO's intentions in the East are? One of the reasons why we um, so strongly convey this message of uh, defense and dialogue is that uh, especially when uh, uh, tensions are high as they are now, uh, it is important to have transparency and predictability. And uh, one of the reasons why we think it's useful to have uh, the NATO-Russia Council is that we can use this council to uh, be transparent uh, about what we are uh, doing. Uh, and also, of course, uh, ask uh, Russia to be uh, uh, the same to us uh, in, a, uh, in a reciprocal uh, way. Uh, and uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the last meeting we had a couple of weeks ago, one of the uh, items on the agenda was exactly military activity, uh, transparency and risk reduction. Uh, and uh, and uh, with increased military presence, with increased military activity, uh, the need for this kind of transparency, predictability, uh, just uh, uh, increases. Um, uh, we, um, we are uh, now looking into the possibility of holding a new meeting of the NATO-Russia Council. Uh, it's a broad agreement uh, among NATO allies to uh, try to seek uh, to have uh, a new meeting. Uh, but of course we have to consult with Russia, we have to agree on the uh, agenda. Uh, but uh, among NATO allies so there is support for uh, for. Uh, take it also for, for, for working, for having a new meeting, uh, uh, but uh, there has to be consultations with Russia before we can uh, have a meeting and we have to agree on the modalities and the uh, agenda. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, announcements of uh, more framework nations, I'm not able to go into details about that. Uh, we are working uh, on the issue of forward presence. As I have stated before, we are uh, 
uh, we have received uh, advice from our military uh, planners, our strategic commanders, uh, uh, recommending uh, battalion-sized presence in different uh, East and allied countries. And we are now looking into uh, those uh, proposals. And then we will discuss it also at the Defence Ministerial meeting and then make decisions by the summit. Comrade Sun, second row. No. Gentlemen over there. Uh, one short question about uh, Russian at the Council again. Uh, could you specify exactly what topics and what issues should and must be discussed at uh, the meeting? First of all, uh, I think it's important to say that what we did yesterday was that we discussed this in our informal meeting and then uh, uh, it was broad agreement. Uh, 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 both for uh, our uh, fundamental message about uh, combining strength, uh, deterrence, defense, and uh, dialogue. And we discussed both the need uh, to enhance our forward presence in the eastern part of the alliance and continue to uh, uh, adapt our military uh, posture. But based on this, we uh, also find a broad agreement inside NATO uh, for uh, seeking to convene a, a new meeting of the NATO-Russia Council because we believe it is important to have open channels for political dialogue, especially in times uh, like uh, the, uh, the times we are facing now. Uh, for us, it has uh, always been important to address Ukraine, uh, but when it comes to uh, the other items on the agenda, I think uh, the right thing now is to uh, sit down and consult, consult with uh, Russia and then uh, uh, sort out uh, the modalities and uh, the exact uh, uh, timing of the uh, meeting. Uh, I would like to underline that uh, we never suspended uh, the NATO-Russia Council. What we suspended was the practical cooperation. Uh, we had a meeting uh, uh, some weeks ago and I stated after that meeting that uh, I think uh, uh, we should have new meetings and now we are looking into the possibility of having a meeting before uh, our summit in uh, July. And we have to do that in consultation with Russia. Gentleman in front row. An answer my Manigi from Salomo Tandar. My question is, um, uh, the other day Douglas Lute called it an unfinished business. And in his testimony before the Senate Armed Security Committee, General Campbell said that uh, the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces did not possess the necessary combat uh, power to protect every part of the country. This year, the Afghan army withdrew from a number of districts in Helmand and other provinces. There is fighting right now in more than 25 different parts of Afghanistan. The Taliban have made gains in the relatively stable northern Afghanistan. The country still does not have a defense minister. Given all of this, will this business finish? And will NATO change anything to finish it or uh, continue the status quo? We have never said that it was going to be easy uh, in Afghanistan. And when we ended our combat mission uh, at, uh, at the end of 2014 and handed over the full responsibility to the Afghan forces uh, for security in Afghanistan, we underlined very strongly that uh, this was uh, a big task and, uh, and that uh, it uh, in no way was going to be an e easy task. Uh, and we also listened very carefully when our military commanders uh, briefed us uh, in detail uh, about the operations and the military uh, challenges and situation in Afghanistan during the meeting we just uh, uh, finished. Uh, but at the same time, uh, our military commanders also reported about the courage, about the determination and, uh, and about the professionalism of the Afghan uh, army and security forces. Uh, it's an army of 350,000 soldiers and uh, police. And they have been able uh, to take responsibility for the security in Afghanistan. And they have been able also to uh, retake uh, Kunduz in three weeks and they have been able uh, to uh, uh, hold the ground and to perform in a professional way. Uh, they still need help. There's still a way to go. And that's, uh, that's exactly why uh, NATO uh, is committed to continue to support them. Uh, so we decided today 
uh, to sustain our resolute support mission beyond 2016. Uh, so we will continue to be there with NATO forces and, uh, and partner forces to help train, assist and advise the Afghan army. Uh, we uh, decided uh, and we are in the process of mobilizing the necessary funds for continued financial uh, support to the Afghan National uh, Army and Security Forces and we will continue our political and practical cooperation with Afghanistan. So we are committed, we will continue to support them, uh, exactly because this is not an easy task, but they have proven to be capable, professional, and they have shown uh, courage. BBC. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan Marcus, the BBC. Good, uh, good afternoon, Secretary General. Question on the uh, deployments eastwards. I mean, a lot of emphasis on uh, now forward deployment eastward, uh, the whole pattern of exercises and so on that have been established to reassure uh, those allies who are concerned about Russian uh, actions. Why, though, is NATO still so reluctant to simply say, look, the Russians have uh, thrown away the, uh, the, the old book and uh, torn up the agreements that we've had with them. Uh, we're going to base troops permanently in Eastern Europe. Uh, the Polish government, for one, clearly uh, would like to see permanent NATO bases uh, in Eastern Europe. Why is it all so tentative? Uh, you know, rule malls of troops, uh, one exercise ends, another begins, uh, not going to base permanently, and so on. Why are you just not going to send a clearer message and say, yes, we are going to deploy a limited number of troops uh, forward permanently in Eastern Europe because the security situation has changed? We are sending a clear message. Uh, we are sending a clear message about that we are going to have troops in the eastern part of the alliance. We are going to increase our forward presence uh, with military forces uh, in the eastern part of our uh, alliance. Uh, we made that decision in February. Now we are in the process of uh, deciding on the details, the scale and the, and the, and the composition and, and, and exactly where to deploy. Uh, so we have already sent a very clear signal about forward presence of uh, NATO forces, uh, multinational forces, and I have also told you that uh, what we are looking into now is uh, uh, advice from our military commanders that this forward presence shall be uh, uh, based on or uh, uh, shall, shall consist of uh, battalion-sized uh, forces in different uh, uh, Eastern uh, NATO allied countries. But exact where and the exact composition is uh, an issue which we are now assessing and we will announce it when we uh, make our decisions uh, at uh, the uh, Warsaw uh, summit in uh, a few weeks. Uh, so we are sending a clear signal and also the, the signal of having a multinational presence sends also a very clear signal about that an attack on one ally will be an attack on the whole alliance. But at the same time, we are sending a signal uh, about that NATO does not seek confrontation. We don't want a new Cold War, and we are still striving for a more uh, constructive and cooperative relationship with Russia. Therefore, we are keeping the challenge for political dialogue open, and therefore, we are also making sure that everything we do is defensive, it is proportionate, and it's fully in line with our international commitments. So I think it is always important to find a balance, partly a balance between forward presence and increased ability to reinforce if needed. We have also increased the readiness of our forces. And a balance between military strength, uh, determination, deterrence, and political dialogue. And uh, NATO is striking that balance now, and we are uh, deciding on the details uh, as we move towards the uh, summit in uh, Warsaw. Financial Times. General Sanchez, Financial Times. Um, I'm wondering, in striking that balance, for whose benefit is it? Because a lot of people um, have talked uh, extensively about uh, Russia's willful misinterpretation of NATO actions. Uh, the deployments in the Baltics and the East, as you know, are, are regarded by Russia or certainly talked about publicly as being an expansion of NATO that's tantamount to an act of aggression. So um, is the NATO-Russia Council um, and some of these measures for dialogue, are they really aimed at the members of the alliance who themselves are um, more wary of, of being uh, so strongly uh, opposed to, to Russia and Russian aggression? Is this really about internal reassurance rather than external dialogue? It is about doing what we said that we should do. 
uh, and we have stated very clearly that we are going to reinforce our collective defense in Europe. And we have implemented all that with uh, the readiness action plan, increased readiness of our forces. We have tripled the size of the NATO response force and we have created a new high readiness force. And now we are moving forward with increased forward presence in the eastern part of the alliance. But we have also stated clearly that we will uh, continue to strive for a more constructive relationship with Russia and continue uh, to keep channels for political dialogue uh, open. And uh, as I stated, one of the reasons why this is, uh, is so important is to exactly avoid that kind of misunderstandings, uh, 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 misinterpretations uh, and miscalculations. So one of, one of the purposes of having open dialogue with Russia is to tell them exactly what we are doing. Uh, so there can be no reason to uh, misunderstand or, or miscalculate. Uh, and add to that that uh, with increased military activity along our borders, uh, the risks for incidents and accidents uh, is increasing. And we have seen the downing of the Russian plane over Turkey. We have seen uh, unsafe behavior of, of some, so, uh, some Russian planes close to uh, uh, US uh, ships and, and planes in the Baltics recently. And for me, that just underlines the importance of transparency, predictability, military lines of communications, partly to try to avoid these kind of incidents and accidents, and if they happen, make sure that they don't spiral out of control. So for me, this is about doing what we have said that we will do, uh, defense and dialogue, uh, uh, try to uh, re uh, reduce tensions, uh, not escalate, and, uh, and uh, uh, seek to avoid uh, confrontation and a new Cold uh, War. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a great and big challenge, uh, but uh, NATO is used to uh, f be faced with big challenges, and uh, therefore we have also uh, implemented the biggest adaptation of our alliance since the end of the Cold War with, uh, the, adapt with the decisions we have made over the last uh, couple of years. The lady in the second row. Nina Elina, Vietnamese to Russian newspaper. I have two questions again about Russia. First, today you've mentioned that uh, NATO and European Union have common response to Russian politics in Ukraine. Would you please elaborate whether you already discussed any particular ideas, proposals, programs with uh, Federica Madrini? A second question, you've mentioned many times during this day this dual approach to Russia, dialogue plus deterrence. I'm afraid this concept is not clearly understood in Moscow. So after Montenegro membership, you already got response from Russian politicians who said it's fueling tension in Europe and again exercises in the near future. What makes you think that after that, Moscow is still be open to dialogue? Thank you. Uh, to be honest, I didn't understand the first question about the Ukraine. And NATO cooperation, I yeah, mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I Common response, yeah. any particular ideas yes. you've discussed yeah. today? My, my message there is that, uh, of course, the European Union and NATO, we are two different organizations with uh, different uh, capabilities, uh, different uh, skills, different, uh, 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 different institutions. Uh, but uh, we are uh, complementary and we are working uh, closely together. Uh, and we have seen that. Uh, also, when it comes to the response to Russia's uh, illegal annexation of uh, Crimea and, uh, and uh, its uh, policies uh, regarding or when it comes to destabilizing eastern Ukraine. Uh, because the European Union uh, has implemented economic sanctions, uh, while NATO has uh, uh, implemented uh, uh, the readiness action plan or, or delivered uh, uh, increased deterrence and defense uh, as part of our military adaptation we have seen since 2014. So that's in a way the European Union delivering economic sanctions, NATO delivering uh, military uh, deterrence and uh, defense. And uh, together this is a very strong and united uh, response. Uh, uh, I strongly believe that also in Moscow uh, they understand that in the long run, uh, they will gain more from uh, cooperating with NATO and the European Union and the West than confronting uh, us. And uh, I think it's obvious that what we do is a response on uh, the Russian behavior in Ukraine. Uh, before that happened, we didn't have any kind of the same 
force presence in the eastern part of uh, the alliance as we are planning to have now. And the assurance measures, the increased military presence, is something that came after uh, the uh, uh, annexation of uh, Crimea. Uh, and I have, I have often used my own country, Norway, as an example. Uh, for decades, uh, Norway has had a good working relationship with Russia. Uh, we have cooperated on energy, on fishery, on border delimitation, on environment, and, men, and actually also military activities up in the north. And we have been able to do so not despite of our membership in, the, in NATO, but because of. Because that the, the gave us the foundation, the strength, to be able to also engage with, uh, with Russia. So I believe that in, in Moscow they understand that uh, cooperation, uh, a more constructive relationship is something that will gain both Russia and NATO in the long run. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we don't have time for all the other questions because the Secretary General has another meeting. Uh, thank you. This concludes this press point. Thank you so much.